second. But firstly, I thought it was useful just to um, say a little bit about who I am, because that may influence how you relate to what I'm saying. So I'm very much um, uh, a practicing social scientist, for want of a better way of putting it, um, who has come to philosophy to try and find more of a grounding for some of the challenges that I see and, and trying to figure out how best to practice what I do. So um, I've spent a bit of time looking into the philosophical literature. I should give very much thanks to Conrad Heilemann uh, Erasmus for uh, inviting me to go over and visit them um, for a few months uh, back in 2018. Um, also, thanks to um, Catherine Furman as well as uh, Yafeng and John. Um, this is, in a way, a talk that came out of some of my interest, but I may not have developed in the form it has done if it wasn't for a series of invitations to talk about this and develop my thinking. So the fact that this, uh, this set of thinking exists at all, I suppose, comes out of um, the kind invitations to speak by a series of people. Um, that's not to kind of discourage you from um, noting if there is anything that I say where uh, I guess the, the typical thing that social scientists do when they come to philosophy is just be um, inadequately precise. So I appreciate your, your guidance um, in uh, where I need to make my argument more precise as well as where my argument doesn't hold in one way or another. Um, but that said, so what I want to talk about today um, is in three parts. Um, so firstly, I'm going to talk about conceptually how I think uh, mixed methods, evidential pluralism, um, can help us avoid wishful thinking. I'm then going to apply this to a case uh, looking at the causal effect of harsh versus lenient social security policies, particularly conditionality and sanctioning, um, which is an area that I uh, have worked in and continue to work in. And finally, I'm going to come back to some possible, well, three in particular possible objections to my account and my responses to those. Um, uh, Yefei and John have kindly given me a sort of a, a, a long slot within the conference to talk about this, um, but I still have a lot to say, so there'll be bits that I inevitably have to skim over a little bit, but I'm happy to come back to these in more detail um, in the questions. And I will try very hard to keep to time uh, so speak for something like uh, 35, 40 minutes, uh, ideally, to really leave a good time for discussions afterwards. Um, I, sh I should sort of say at the start that um, from, from the discussion yesterday and some of the conversations yesterday, and I, I wasn't able to be in all of the sessions, sadly, due to childcare issues, um, but uh, there may be some of you that agree with what I'm saying, but there'll definitely be some of you that disagree. So hopefully we can have a good conversation about that at the end. So without further ado, let me set out uh, what I've been hinting at so far about how mixed methods can help us avoid wishful thinking. So most of the arguments, I'm, I'm to a certain extent using evidential pluralism and mixed methods as um, synonymous here. I realise that for both of these, there's multiple different accounts of what these things mean, some of which overlap, some of which are different. Um, so we can come back to that whether it should be mixed methods or mixed methodologies and so on. But for the time being, I'm just going to treat these as, as synonymous for the purposes of my argument. So most arguments for mixed methods or, or evidential pluralism are based on one of two arguments. Um, one of them is what I would call complementarity, sort of following Martin Hammersley and others. So very crudely that different methods have different strengths and weaknesses and or they can answer different questions. So it's great to have mixed methods because it enables us to see everything, but you're not really sort of combining them in a certain sense. Now there's, there's loads of different forms of this, um, one of which you could loosely call kind of pragmatic mixed methods research as exemplified by lots of the things in the Journal of Mixed Methods Research, where really it's a kind of, we don't want to talk about philosophy, we just want to use different methods and bring them together and have a look at the different things we see from using them. So this is perhaps the most common approach to mixed methods research. There's sort of two other sets of things that I've grouped within this um, that are sort of more philosophically minded. One of them are the, the criticisms of just using randomized control trials that are particularly associated with Nancy Cartwright and various collaborators, including Angus Deaton and, and Jeremy Hardy, other people have 
uh, focused on and the things that, against this idea that RCTs should be at the top of the evidence hierarchy, outlining the ways in which uh, RCTs have limitations that qualitative research um, can provide a valuable complement to. So that's one sort of variant on this. Another one is the one that uh, Yafeng and John set out yesterday on evidential pluralism, which I also take to be a, a form of complementarity. Uh, they, 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 they disagree, surely. The other sets of arguments for mixed methods are, are often around triangulation. Um, so as Martin Hammersley puts it um, in his sort of typology, uh, which was quite influential in some of the mixed methods literature, findings from quantitative and qualitative techniques are used to check one another on the basis that they are likely to involve different sorts of threats to validity. Now the most the most common way that this is conceptualized is, you know, you do some quantitative research and some qualitative research, and if they come to the same conclusion, this gives you more confidence in your conclusions. There's actually relatively little about what I'm going to talk about today, which is where you do quantitative and qualitative research, or different sorts of quant, or different sorts of qual, and they collide with one another. They're, they're not so much checking one another and supporting it, but uh, they're, they're challenging one another. You sometimes see things in the mixed methods literature that talks about uh, this sort of conflict between approaches. Um, Moffat et al, Suzanne Moffat's paper from 2006 is a, a very nice and widely cited example, um, but it does come up relatively rarely in this literature. And where it does come up, it's mostly pragmatic. So it's a case of good mixed methods researchers being faced with these conflicts and then trying to think through how to make sense of them in the most useful way possible. But it, it, it's a case of practice leading theory rather than trying to set out in what way these sorts of conflicts can be useful or indeed necessary. So my focus here, rather than on sort of triangulation as it's usually done or complementarity as, as others set out, is on what I call collisions between quantitative and qualitative research, where it's not just they're finding out about different aspects of the same thing, but they appear to contradict one another's findings directly. And my argument here is that this is a really valuable way of avoiding wishful thinking um, in social science research. And in making this argument, I'm going to very heavily use the work of the uh, feminist philosopher of science, Helen Longino, um, uh, whose work I think is great. And um, you can talk more about some of the details of her work. Um, those of you who don't know her work, but are well versed in the wider literature, if there are any of you, um, we'll see the overlaps with uh, Popper's work. It's a kind of development of this in a particular different direction. Not that that debt is necessarily acknowledged by Longino herself. But anyway, put very simply, uh, Longino's account says that background assumptions are the ways in which values and ideology are incorporated into scientific inquiry. So she was particularly looking at um, research into sex differences and the various different paradigms of research that uh, Look at that, and quite often these literatures would end up producing um, uh, androcentric findings, even though the people within them were very concerned for doing good science. And the reason that this happens, she argues, in her sort of detailed accounts of this over several books, is that it's through the background assumptions that people make. And there's various sort of specific examples that she uses there. But this is a sort of a, a general epistemic contextualism approach. And what she argues in the face of this is that diverse debate is the only real way that you can deal with this, because diverse debate is the only way that you can bring these background assumptions to light. Uh, as she puts it most strongly in some sort of more recent work, diverse debate is the only check against the arbitrary dominance of subjective, metaphysical, political, aesthetic preference in scientific research. Now, Longino herself doesn't particularly use this as an argument for mixed methods or evidential pluralism. As I said, she's mainly looking at research on sex differences, and she's arguing that um, you need social diversity, particularly you need more women in lots of these fields that are dominated by men, to challenge some of these background assumptions in order to get better scientific research. So that's very much her focus, and that's very much the way that Longino's work has been taken. But my argument uh, is really that 
to take what she said and apply it to the, the idea of mixed methods research in that we need methodological diversity in order to reveal the background assumptions within particular methods. And if you are just doing mono method research, you may come to particular conclusions that uh, rather than reflecting the, the state of things, in fact, is sort of wishful thinking by virtue of unchallenged background assumptions. And if you're doing mixed methods research, then these assumptions can become visible through these collisions between methods. Um, and this is an important way of avoiding wishful thinking. Now, this argument so far is very much an argument I did at an event last year in Cork. Um, uh, but as Catherine Furman pointed out there, uh, after the presentation and in discussions afterwards, I didn't really set out how we should respond to collisions. So my thanks to Catherine for pointing out that my first response to her question on this was woefully inadequate. So here is a better attempt uh, to specify how we should respond to collisions. So Longinot, so part of Longinot's account is around the need for diversity. But alongside this, she also said, well, it's not enough to just have diversity. There also needs to be a debate within this diversity against some shared standards. Now, this idea of shared standards is very easily um, misunderstood. So, you know, one interpretation of what Longinot says, which I don't think is fair, is that this is sort of some methodological imperialist attempt to um, impose one set of way, one set of methodological prescriptions on a wide variety of methodological practice. And that's not what Longinot said. So it doesn't require monism. It's, it's not that the, these sort of shared standards are meant to provide a deterministic theory of theory choice, uh, as she puts it back in her early work on this. Rather, the minimal requirement is a commitment to empirical adequacy. So it may be that there's other shared standards between people using different methods uh, that become part of this debate. But at a very minimal level, the one thing that should unite all social science research is a commitment to empirical adequacy. And as she puts it, this permits a diversity of beliefs, but unity in the methods of evaluation. We'll, we'll come back um, a little bit to this towards the end. Uh, but the point really is that even when methods are coming from very different philosophical positions and where their framing of the world may be very different. To some extent, if they are saying different things about um, the way the world really is, uh, then they can have an argument uh, with reference to empirical adequacy, even if there is a lot in their accounts that is not shared. Now, that gives us a sort of a, a maybe a three-step approach for when there is a seeming collision between methods in their findings, how we can make this epistemically fruitful. Because it's perfectly possible for there to be collisions that are not epistemically fruitful. And indeed, um, there's, there's various examples of this in the literature. So the first step is to try and figure out what it is that this is a collision of. So a lot of collisions are a collision of ways of framing the world about political perspectives. Um, there's lots of other standards or assumptions that can be involved in the work that researchers are doing that can be colliding. Um, but if they're not about empirical adequacy, then you can't use empirical adequacy as the, the um, sort of baseline standard to have a debate to adjudicate against them. And we can come back to this in particular case that I'm talking about shortly. So once you've ensured that the collision is with respect to empirical adequacy in some sense, in that there, there just appears to be a direct conflict in what they're saying about the way the world is, then you then need to use this collision to challenge the assumptions of both methods. Um, there is a tendency sometimes where there is a collision for people on one side to go, ah, this means that there is something wrong with your method. But for this, for this collision to be epistemically fruitful, both sides need to be willing to challenge their assumptions that they've brought into uh, their research. And they then need to engage in a debate in good faith with, as Longinot puts it, tempered equality of authority. We, we can come back to spelling out what that means. Uh, but in short, that means equality of authority, but subject to some 
uh, rules about how it is that you're engaging in this debate. Um, so you need to meet those rules in order to participate in this debate with equality of authority. If you, for example, um, are not engaging in this in good faith, if you don't appear to be responsive to what the other side is saying, then you can be legitimately ignored, non Um Not that this is not a point I particularly develop here, but there are sort of things here that resonate with the practice of adversarial collaboration, um, which psychologists, some psychologists in particular, have been developing, which I think is a really promising way of implementing some of the things here. <laughs> So just by way of a sort of, uh, that's my kind of introduction to um, the theoretical account uh, I want to make. Um, hopefully there is some of that that is convincing, but there may be also some of that that you wonder about how practically you would end up doing this as well as some other objections. I'm gonna come back to that uh, at the end. Uh, but before then, I just want to go through a particular case um, which sort of may flesh out a little bit of what I'm talking about here. So my case is on the debate on uh, whether, whether the effects of harsh policies to benefit claimants, um, and particularly around conditionality and benefit sanctions. Uh, so for those of you who are completely unaware of this debate, um, there has been a real move in social security systems worldwide, um, particularly in high income countries, but not in restricted to them, um, to, to make benefits more conditional, which is to say there are more requirements that benefit claimants are required to fulfill in order to get their benefit. And if they don't meet those requirements, then their benefit is cut, which is the meaning of the benefit sanction. Now, there's, there's a, that as a general policy approach conceals a wide variety of what conditionality and sanctions might mean, as we'll come back to. Um, but the, the area you can sort of think of as a field about uh, what are the impacts of these policies and whether they're a good thing to do or not. And this is a field in which I'm an active participant um, and have been for a bit of time, um, primarily, I suppose, as a quanti quantitative researcher, but also as a qualitative researcher and doing things that are kind of comparative policy analysis, which is not sort of traditional qualitative research, but certainly the quantitative research. One aspect of this that is worth flagging, given the discussions about um, you know, causal homogeneity versus causal heterogeneity uh, that have come up already in this event, um, is that there is a sort of a drive, particularly in the UK benefit system, to personalise the way the benefit system works. So rather than having blanket requirements that apply to everyone, to, to have requirements that are personalised to the individual in question. So that makes the policy sort of more complex in a sense, but there is still a large debate about the average effect of introducing um, conditionality, even if this is personalized to individuals. So even accepting that conditionality includes a wide range of different policies and those are adapted to particular individuals in question who may have different responses to things, the question of average effects is still an important one about whether these policies are a good idea or not. And the three bits of research that I'm going to talk about, three sets of research really, are um, firstly um, uh, qualitative interviews with benefit claimants themselves. And I'm particularly going to use the Welfare Conditionality Project because it's the biggest and best example of this in the UK that exists. So as you can see on, on the slide, this included over a thousand interviews from nearly 500 people, which is... Um, I mean, in many ways, a ludicrous approach to doing uh, a qualitative research project, but it was, um, it, it gave it particular clout in public debate, as well as causing obviously massive practical headaches for the team of people involved in doing it. So, and, and they've done a great job in doing it. Uh, and, and I take it as an example of the best of that particular type of, of research in this field. I talk a little bit also about uh, experiments and quasi-experiments, um, primarily done by um, European econometricians, including some that I reviewed back in a 2017 paper. And I also talk about some cross-national quantitative research, which isn't published yet, though I've got a working paper from a conference on it, uh, which I'll, I'll talk very briefly about at the end. 
in what I'm going to talk about, I'm obviously going to be simplifying a very complex debate a certain amount just to fit into the next 10-15 minutes or so. Um, but again, I'm happy to give more detail about this debate as it's relevant to the things that we might be talking about here. So let's firstly go to the Welfare Conditionality Project, WealthCon. So based on this qualitative research with claimants, very large scale qualitative research, um, they make a strong claim that conditionality in the UK is an ineffective approach to getting people back to work. As they put it in their final findings report from a couple of years ago, welfare conditionality within the social security system was largely ineffective in moving respondents into unemployment. In the exceptional cases where welfare conditionality played an important role in triggering a positive employment trajectory, appropriate personalized employment focused support rather than sanctions can be clearly identified as of fundamental importance. So they're really trying to say it really doesn't work. And when there's occasional signs that might have had a positive role, it's really more about other things rather than about conditionality itself. Um, and this finding has been very prominent in public debate. Um, not universally trusted, but definitely influential. So that's uh, Pete Dwyer, who is the PI of the Welfare Conditionality Project, in a man I have an incredible amount of respect for and like very much. Um, that's Pete uh, giving evidence to the Work and Pensions Parliamentary Select Committee, which he did on several different occasions. Now, it, it is interesting, just as an aside to note here, given I have interests in credibility um, uh, as another domain of, of some of these debates, um, that there were sort of accusations of cherry picking that were leveled at this project as happens very commonly to qualitative projects. So one of the things they end up doing in their final report is quantifying this qualitative research about the extent to which people uh, moved towards work or didn't move towards work over the period and then subdividing them. So again it's a kind of an interesting aside about quantitizing qualitative research and the conversions of things between one method or another. But that's not really my central focus here. So with, within this, I want to talk about a different sets of collisions. So at the simplest level, the first collision is that what welfare conditionality was claiming there is contradicted by the experimental and quasi-experimental evidence from econometricians. So here are the conclusions of some admittedly non-systematic reviews, as there's not been a systematic review in this field. Uh, the UK National Audit Office in 2016 saying studies show people who receive sanctions more likely to get work. Uh, a paper from the sort of widely respected um, uh, centre IZA from Duncan McVicker. Job search monitoring and benefit sanctions increase the exit from unemployment benefits and job entry rates in the short term. And another uh, study from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation in the UK. So, and then there's various individual studies within this that we can talk about that offer, you know, very compelling experimental or quasi-experimental evidence of these effects. So, okay, this is a direct collision here. This isn't just the, the methods of talking about different things. They are talking about the same thing and they're coming to different conclusions about it. So what could be going on here? How do we understand this? So one way that we, under, we can understand this, if we sort of try and challenge some of the assumptions of the Welfare Conditionality Project, is around the balance of competing mechanisms. So what qualitative research can do is it can show us the different competing mechanisms that operate. But what this sort of qualitative research is not good at doing is showing the balance of these competing mechanisms, because that's not something that these approaches are particularly good at. I don't particularly think that's what's going on, but it's one element of it. A second problem, and I think this is more fundamental, is when you are using um, interviews with people who are experiencing something, um, what you often get is kind of narrative accounts of what's going on. And there is a need to question uh, how these narrative accounts work. So here's an example from the detail of one of the reports from one of the participants in WealthCon. Because they sanction me, it doesn't make me any different. At the end of the day, I've said to myself, I'm looking for a job. I'm determined to get off the group. I'm determined to get off benefits. And that is just the way that people talk. You know, the way that people talk isn't that, you know, I'm a bit lazy, I couldn't be bothered doing things, or 
you know, I just wanted to wait and see. I just, I wanted to get my head around the fact that I've loved my job. You know, the, the way that people say is, you know, I am motivated to work. Um, in my own qualitative research, at one point, I asked people um, how hard they thought they worked in their job. And the responses I got were upwards of 100%. So 100%, 110%, 200%, and up. You know, people describe themselves as hardworking. This is the way that people talk. And there is a question about whether this, is this evidence of causality or is this just the way that people talk? And what I think this feeds into is there's a strong risk of wishful thinking in some of this qualitative research, which is not employing a kind of a rigorous process tracing approach, but it's just very sort of lived experience based research where, you know, this has important roles in the policy process, but can be questioned in terms of its evidence of causal effects, where nice interventions will be seen to be effective because people will talk about them as making a positive difference and nasty interventions will be described as ineffective. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is good evidence of causal effects. At the same time, you can see this collision as challenging the experimental and quasi-experimental evidence from economists, which also makes a series of assumptions which on further inspection are probably not supportable. So one of these in particular is about causal heterogeneity. So, you know, these the, the literature on the positive effects of conditionality um, is largely around um, people with relatively few barriers to work. And in the qualitative research in WorldCon, it is clear that it is particularly ineffective for disabled people, where it is just counterproductive to try and threaten people into work, partly because the mechanisms around their reasons for not working are different and the things that are going to help them work are going to be different, but also because the implementation of conditionality for disabled people is a lot harder. Um, Put simply, there is no point in requiring to people to do things they are not capable of doing. But trying to figure out what people are capable of doing is a formidably difficult thing for benefit systems to do. So in fact, for example, the British benefit system attempt to do this has been incredibly counterproductive, because it, partly because it's been implemented so badly, but also because the mechanisms are different. And this has in fact been later confirmed by a small number of quasi-experiments uh, including that this is a particular focus of my own 2017 review of quasar experimental evidence. So what seemed to be a fairly solid conclusion coming out of the experimental research is challenged by the qualitative research. And that, quali that challenge later comes to be borne out by quantitative research that tests some of the theoretical uh, implications of this. Now, um, I'm not going to talk just on the basis of time, there's a whole series of other qualitative channel challenges to the experiments as well around different outcomes that we might be interested in and whether short term uh, job outcomes are really the most important outcomes that matter and whether there's longer term outcomes uh, or different domains of outcomes that we might also be interested in. And again, that's just to say that the challenges that the WealthCom project posed to that Econometric evidence have also been borne out in later uh, econometric evidence. So, you know, there's, you know, the, there's these sort of two different types of research which often don't come into contact with it. Either. But if you have a look at them and you bring them and you look at the collision, you can see that it is challenging assumptions that on further reflection sometimes may be unsupportable um, and worthy of further research. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about another set of evidence that you can bring in here, just to sort of deepen the point that's being made here. So, the quasi-experiments from econometricians, even if we need to really heavily caveat what they're saying, they're clearly showing that um, conditionality, um, in set uh, reduced incentives to claim benefits, restrictions for eligibility, um, all of those things are good things in um, uh, lowering unemployment and increasing employment. So, you know, they seem to be showing that harsh benefit policies are better, even if that's not for all groups. And there's also longer term outcomes and wider domains of outcomes that could be questioned. But for short term job outcomes, that evidence seems fairly clear. But if we look comparatively about 
whether countries that implement those sorts of policies have higher employment rates for disabled people, then we actually found the opposite. So countries with harsher sets of policies have lower employment among disabled people. In coming to that conclusion, I am glossing over a whole series of formidable methodological challenges in comparing the employment rates of disabled people across countries. So I have a whole working paper that does that. Um, but as suffice to say, I think that conclusion is pretty strong, however you try and do this. And then this raises further questions. So, you know, in comparative, re comparative research, you know, one account might just be, well, these countries are just different in other ways. So there is a kind of country level confounding going on here. And really, we should go with the quasi experiments over the comparative evidence. Um, but there is, there are other ways of interpreting this difference between these accounts. So one of them is just the limited generalizability of some of these experiments that may apply in limited situations, but when they're rolled out on a wider basis, um, start getting applied to people for whom the counterproductive effects uh, are predominant, given there's multiple competing mechanisms going on here. Or we may even think that there's a kind of a wider level of causation going on at the country level, which is to say that you know, within a particular way of organizing the benefit system and the employment system, which we might sort of think of benefit and employment regimes uh, working together. Um, within that, the introduction of conditionality may encourage people to go back to work in the short term, but is also associated with a whole bunch of changes to the labor market, which actually lower employment rates for disabled people in the medium to long run. Um, so a, a kind of a particular thing here is around job retention. So the real difference between countries that have high employment rates and lower employment rates among disabled people is job retention. Um, but uh, sort of weak um, employment retention obligations for disabled people go hand in hand with these sort of harsh benefit policies. So maybe there's just a way of thinking where these things work together, which overall leads to worse outcome. So that's a sort of a fairly complex set of three different sets of evidence. And I don't particularly want to come to a sort of an overall conclusion here, except to say that I think the collisions between those uh, methodologies is incredibly valuable for avoiding wishful thinking, just avoiding the assumptions inherent in the different methods to try and come to a better account of the actual impacts of these policies on average in, in a particular population in a way that is useful for policy debate. So let's come back from the case study again to the, the account that I'm trying to persuade you of and three sets of potential objections that you may well be having at this stage. So the first objection is that, you know, quantitative and qualitative research have different fundamental assumptions and they can't have collisions because they're just talking about different things that can't be brought into kind of a useful, productive reconciliation of one another. So uh, there's obviously a long standing uh, history to this debate. Um, I guess I would, you know, from, from when I was learning my trade, I particularly traced this to the paradigm wars between quant and qual in the 1990s. Um, but in the sort of 20 or 30 years since then, you know, there are some accounts that we now have a kind of paradigm piece and everybody is, is in a much better position than they were in the 1990s at, at, to bring different methods to bear with one another. But there is still a very strong argument uh, from many people that quant and qual are incommensurable. So uh, Derek Beach's work, uh, uh, he was referring to this sort of around the edges of his presentation yesterday, um, but his uh, paper um, that came out earlier this year makes this case very strongly. So this, this account clearly is, is not dead at the present time. My response to this, to which I'm sure Derek will disagree, but, but my response to this is that the, the idea that these different methodologies are incommensurable is a way of insulating our assumptions from challenge. It's a way of insulating ourselves from collisions. Which is not to say that, you know, all of the standards of different methodologies are shared and that debate is necessarily easy between people who are coming at things from different perspectives. But insofar as theories have observable implications that may be visible by qual and quant methods, and that qual and quant methods seem to be saying directly different things about the empirical world, um, 
then we can bring use these collisions to bring out the role of these a priori assumptions in the conclusions we're coming to. And to the extent there are a priori assumptions um, that are associated with empirical adequacy. So for example, a sort of a, a wholesale account of I'm not looking at average effects. I think those are kind of liable to lead to wishful thinking. Um, you know, causal homogeneity or heterogeneity is actually something that we can look at empirically. And we can have an, uh, a theoretical account that makes predictions of what we should see using different sorts of methodologies that we should be able to bring into some productive tension. So, you know, I, I don't want to say that there's no differences between people coming from different methodologies or that reciprocal translation is easy, but to the extent they're talking about the same thing, I think we can quite comfortably bring them to bear on one another in the way that I've just demonstrated in the case book. A second approach, which is slightly different, a criticism might be, well, academics really strongly resist challenging their assumptions. Um, uh, and I think this is undoubtedly true. So you see in the social sciences, there is a fragmentation of people into what Lunde et al call, uh, following Nor Satina, epistemic cultures, although uh, as Lunde et al point out, they're meaning something slightly different about it. So Lunde et al is a really nice paper about um, uh, a mixed method study gone wrong and trying to figure out what went wrong there. Um, and they're sort of saying there just seems to be two groups of people who are not capable of getting on with each other or willing to challenge one another's assumptions. And so there's a whole line of, of um, thought we can go down in here is, you know, epistemological assumptions are often markers of group membership. And while we may be in a situation where we don't have kind of fierce paradigm wars and we have a certain pragmatic approach, that generally means that coexistence between methodologies happen, but not methodologies going and challenging each other's fundamental assumptions, which uh, is viewed very negatively in a lot of social science. And this is made worse by the fact that these sort of groups are not just defined by their methodologies and some of their epistemological assumptions, but also some of their political perspectives. So we see this in the conditionality case, for example, where um, to challenge qualitative researchers that there may be some domains in which there are short term positive impacts of conditionality um, then causes kind of tensions between groups because people define themselves in opposition to conditionality. So, you know, my, my response to this would be really just to say, um, I think this definitely happens and it's a real challenge. Um, but I think that if we want to avoid wishful thinking, we have an obligation to fight this and to try and seek out potential collisions. And to not do this just risks um, confusing the assumptions of our method with the way the world really is, which is uh, what I'm saying is, is one form of wishful thinking. And then a final thing very quickly, and this is my final slide before concluding, is just uh, whether practically this is an unfeasible requirement. So, um, you know, to one extent, you know, methods are not always in collision with one another. Often different methods or different methodologies are, are aligned with the questions that people are interested in. Um, and that is undoubtedly the case. I'm not saying that every piece of research is colliding with another, um, but there are undoubtedly potential collisions that do exist. And these collisions are not sort of being ruled out. And I think collisions are not reverberating um, because of, partly because of the, the epistemic cultures issue, but also because of a whole series of practical constraints on trying to use collisions in a productive way. So one of them is that seeking out collisions and responding collisions demands a lot of time. Um, and time is not something that academics generally have in abundance. Um, they tend to take on slightly more work than they have time available to do it in. Um, so this is not something that people are keen to do. A second set of practical constraints is around um, having a shared language and the skill requirements to be able to talk about the fundamental assumptions of quantitative and qualitative research. And we can come back to this, but I think this is a really major issue. And I guess the final issue is around the problems of publication, where if you want a really good publication, we're often not challenging the fundamentals of methods, but you are glossing over them instead. And this is even more uh, the case when you're challenging assumptions than when you're just trying to squeeze two methods into a single paper more broadly. 
So I'm going to conclude there, hopefully with about 20 minutes exactly for uh, questions. So I just want to conclude to recap my argument. So firstly, I think conceptually, there is a strong argument about why mixed methods help us avoid wishful thinking uh, by highlighting the background assumptions that are leading to particular conclusions rather than the evidence itself. I think we can see this in the particular case that I've given you of the causal effect of harsh versus lenient social security policies. And finally, my, my summary of the objections is that I think the conceptual challenges to this approach about incommensurability can be rejected. But the practical challenges are formidable and this is something where I guess we need more thoughts about how we can carve out space for these collisions in a way that may be possible to use uh, profitably going forward. Uh, and I shall stop there.